Eric Clift, a Washington-based journalist who's covered many presidential campaigns, but <laughs> none like this one. No. <laughs> uh, let's start with Trump. Uh, so many people looking for his foreign policy vision because it's been scant up to this point. I mean, we really haven't seen a vision, no, right. nothing specific. Um, so a lot riding on this speech. Did we get any specifics from Well, that? it's the first speech in my memory that he has used a teleprompter. So he had written notes, and he realized that he couldn't just stand up there and wing it like he normally does. Uh, and he was very careful to basically say what APEC expects its friends and allies to say. And he appropriately, you know, slammed uh, Hillary Clinton on the other side. But I don't think that we really know what he would do. He does seem in favor of negotiating a deal uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians, which is uh, actually more moderate than uh, his other Republican colleagues, who basically uh, stand so more squarely with Israel that they don't see that there is a, a partner to negotiate with. He uh, had a speechwriter, a teleprompter, as you pointed out. He also met with the Washington Post editorial board and named five people who are going to be his foreign policy advisors. Uh, again, his Republican uh, opponents, though, jumped all over that. Ted Cruz releasing 23 names of policy advisors and, and uh, John Kasich, four pages of foreign policy <laughs> advisors saying, you know, five. Um, uh -huh. Does this, once again, kind of people questioning whether or not he has what it takes to be commander of chief. Does yeah. that hurt him? Uh, it doesn't seem to hurt him with his supporters. Now, the Washington Post has released the full transcript of their uh, editorial meeting, and I'm told that that is really uh, worth reading for anybody who wonders how Mr. Trump's mind works. He doesn't really issue policies or define proposals. He basically puts forth an attitude. The attitude is that we're better than everyone, I'm smarter than everyone, and I can make things happen simply because I'm Donald Trump. Now, that's probably going to get him the nomination. I strongly doubt that it will get him elected in uh, this country, but I guess we'll see. Well, speaking of that, uh, are we already getting a hint of the fall campaign? Because the Democratic challenger uh, pretty much came out and took swings at him right off the bat, didn't yeah. she? Well, I think it's been a truism in the Clinton world that an attack unanswered is an attack that sticks. And so she's not going to sit back and bide her time the way she watched all those Republicans who were once on the stage with Donald Trump who held their fire. So she was pretty direct in going after him, although she did not mention him by name. Shouldn't have to. Everybody realized who she was talking about. And the, the gaffe that he made was to say that he would be somewhat neutral in uh, trying to get a deal between the Israelis and the Palestinians. And uh, AIPAC in the Israeli lobby does not uh, want to hear that. And so Hillary Clinton really uh, jumped on that, basically saying Israel's security is non-negotiable. Try and explain uh, this to uh, our worldwide audience, because right. it's almost as though uh, they're, they're pandering to this group and running for Benjamin Netanyahu's job as prime minister. I mean, it's almost as though they're running for prime minister in Israel. Can you explain why? why? And it's, it's um, a, a foregone conclusion. Every presidential cycle, we see what we're seeing. Right. Well, um, the support of the Jewish community the donors, the voters, are very important to the Democratic Party. And over the last several years, there's been a move towards the right. And uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu came and addressed Congress at the invitation of the Republican uh, leader and uh, did not meet with President Obama on that trip. And so I think this is a battle between the two parties for this particular uh, vote. And I think Hillary Clinton was determined to win back the, uh, the, the APAC, and the Republicans were going to say everything they could think to please APAC, including that the U.S. Embassy should move from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, which is really a non-starter. Uh, so it, it's, it's courting this influential group of voters and, and their funding. I mean, it's a wealthy an influential uh, community. But people who are watching it around the world have to realize that a lot of this is rhetoric and red meat. And U.S. policy has essentially been unchanged for decades, and that is the U.S. supports a negotiated two-state uh, solution. All right. Eleanor, always a pleasure <laughs> having you in. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you.